Hey, thanks for being with us today on the second Sunday of April or whenever you're watching it. We're super excited to have you guys with us. And we're in a series talking about the two things Jesus said were the most important. I love that because like two things, that's two is not too much, right? We can all handle two things. So we're going to get into that in a bit and, uh, and, and even talk about the thing we need to make room for in our life so that those two things he says we really need to do will naturally flow from us. I can't wait to share that with you. But we're going to take some time to worship. We're going to take some time to pray, to give, and then to respond to God's word. So please put aside all distractions and wherever you're at, make some space in these moments so that God can speak to you. It's easy to get distracted. We're actually going to talk a little bit about that in the message today. But try to focus in so you can hear God speak to you through his word and by his spirit. I'm excited that you're here with us. I'm excited for what God's going to speak to you about in these moments. Let's focus in on what God has for us today. count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes I will Lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God is never late is working all things out you're working all things out oh yes I will lift you Yes, I will for all my days. 
you know, we're going to take some time to pray for you today. And we're, we're talking today in the messages you'll hear in a bit about love, that that's the centerpiece. Um, really, it starts with God's love for us and then our love for God and our love for others. And that's like the center of everything. And we're going to get to that point. But it all starts with really knowing God loves you. You know, here's the thing, though. Satan's going to try to convince you um, that you're separated somehow from God's love, that the tragedy you're going through, the difficulty you're going through, the problem you're going through, even the sin in your life um, can can somehow like stop you from being loved by God. But then the Bible reminds us of an incredible truth. Um, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when Paul expresses that under the inspiration of Scripture, he really goes into great detail. He think, he says, not things present, not things to come, not principalities, not powers, not, not this, not that. The next thing can separate us from God's love. Um, so whatever you're facing in your life today that I, I know you feel like is like separating you or creating this distance between you and God. Do you realize that if you give that to God, his love can make up that difference. If it's sin you need to confess, he will forgive you. If if it's a problem, a difficulty in your life that you can't figure out the way out of, he's got the answer. Uh, If it's healing you need, his love can bring you healing body, soul, and spirit. But you got to realize that whatever you're facing that it's gonna, Satan's going to try to use it as a wedge between you and God to create distance between you and him. But I want you to realize that there is no distance between God's love and you. He loves you. Um, can you dare to believe that today? And could you open your heart up to receive the love that he is desperately wanting to pour out into your heart today? Romans 5, 5 says that the love of God is poured out into our heart by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Could, could we in this moment, could we open our heart up um, and allow that to be poured in by the Holy Spirit? You know, he can only pour it in if you open it up. If you have a container and the lid's on the top, you can pour stuff in, but it's not getting in there if the lid's on top. Can you open that lid? Can you open up your life? And could you invite the Spirit to pour in the love of God into your heart in this moment? Um, let's ask him to do that. God, there's a lot of things in life that that can come that will try to convince us that this is the thing that can keep us from God. This is the thing that can separate us from the love of God. Um, Persecution, a difficulty, sore, tribulation, um, hardship, all those kind of things. Um, Our own sin. But the truth is these things only separate us from God's love if we let them. That what we need to do is bring those things to you. And ask you, God, um, to to meet us in that place. To ask for your forgiveness for sin. To ask you, God, to to pour in your love in the situation, believing that you work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. That nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, who's ever watching today, God, can you pour out your love in their heart? Could you remind them of your incredible love for them? And um, could you remind them that nothing can separate them from your love? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, I really want to pray for you today that you receive and feel the love of God because it all starts there. Like everything I'm going to talk about later in the message flows from there. The truth is like when you know that, then it makes you open to receive from God and it also makes you open to give out of what God has given to you. It's true. Like loving people are giving people. That you can give without loving, but you can't love with without giving. Um, when you've received his love, it's natural for you to give back in many ways. That you're going to want to use your gifts in ministry to others. You're going to want to pray for other people. You're want to going to help other people that are in need. And we're going to talk about that in the next couple of weeks. And it comes even down to giving financially from uh, what God has provided for us. So that others could hear about his love. Um, that's a natural response to that. So we want to give you an opportunity to give back to God today. You can go over to greenwall.evangelassembly.org and you can hit um, the the give button. uh, And there you can see a drop down menu and you can see different things you can give to. And all of your gifts to Evangel help us uh, to get the word out about God's love. Like, for example, what you're watching today. You know, this has to be paid for, right? The, The camera equipment, the 
the, the electricity to make it happen, the lighting that makes it all happen, right? The access to be able to put it out there. And people all over um, the world, in fact, watch this. And when you give, you make that possible. And so someone today might be hearing about God's love for the first time. And it's your gift that you give to us that enables that to happen. So I want to encourage you to make that a part of your worship today. Make that a part of your response to God's love for you, that you will give out of that love so that you could give the love of God to others who may be watching this for the first time. So thank you so much for your gift. And may God bless you and know that it makes a difference when you give.
Hey everybody, I want to think about a scene from a movie called Up in the Air. In this scene, there's a, a young man having second thoughts about getting married. The wedding ceremony is about to begin, and he has a serious case of cold feet. He's not sure he can go through with the wedding. A member of the family, who's played by George Clooney, is sent to talk to him. The young man says, I don't think I'll be able to do this. And Clooney's character asks, why would you say that today? And the frightened young man says, well, last night I was kind of laying in bed and I couldn't get to sleep. So I started thinking about the wedding and the ceremony and about our buying a house and moving in together and having a kid and then having another kid and then Christmas and then Thanksgiving and spring break and going to football games. And all of a sudden, they're like graduated and getting jobs and getting married. And, you know, I'm a grandparent and then I'm retired and I'm losing my hair and I'm getting fat. And the next thing I know, I'm dead. And it's like, I can't stop thinking, what's the point? I mean, what's the point? <laughs> you know, when a religious leader asked Jesus one day, of all the commandments, which is the most important, he was basically asking the question, what's the point? What matters most? Well, there's a lot of potential answers to that question, from money to success to beauty to fame to power. Um, but in the biblical story, Jesus says what matters the most is our relationship with God and in others. In this five-week series, we're going to talk about how to get those two things right. And we started this series last week, and we noted that at the center of all the biblical commands, and at the very core of what Jesus meant by everything I've commanded you, that's what we're supposed to teach, right? Matthew 28, 19, Jesus declares that the core of that is to love God with everything you've got and to love your neighbor in the same way that we love ourselves. As we said last week, our response might be, really? Is that even possible to do those things? But well, here's the amazing truth that we saw last week. Jesus actually thinks we can become like him. Jesus actually believes that it's possible for frail, deeply flawed human beings to have our complete affection focused on God and others. Uh, the key word for me here in what I said is possible. And we talked last week about the transformation of our will that has to take place. That we have to move away from just having an impulsive will where we see something shiny and we go after that, right? Whatever the culture tells us or other people tell us is important. Um, that we have to adopt the practice of having a reflective will. That we take time to reflect on the life we live and bring it to God for him to renew us from the inside out. And that moves us to having an embedded will or an embodied will where it's possible to become so aligned with Jesus' heart that our automatic responses, our embodied will, can be in tune with God's heart so that his responses, that's what our response is. Again, Jesus thinks we can get there by being with him and with others who are with him. It's why microgroups that we run at church are so key, that together over a course of a year, we take this journey together supporting each other to become who Jesus knows and thinks we can become. So I want to talk about part one of Jesus' answer today, loving God. But before we can do that, we have to see that there's a pre-part. <laughs> because it doesn't start with us loving God out of the blue. It actually starts with God loving us. The Bible says, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. In Romans, Paul says, for while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And here's what we have to see, that this essential commandment to love God and others is a call to respond to a relationship of love that's already been established. It's not a bar for us to try to achieve, to please God, because um, when you do it that way, you turn from love to legalism, from relationship to religion. Uh, his pleasure, his desire, his love for us was already expressed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That God committed to love us before we did anything. No, you have to see that. Then you can understand Jesus' answer. Dale Bruner summarized what Jesus said here this way. The purpose of living is the adoration of God and the cherishing of human beings. See, God already adores you. God already cherishes you. Otherwise, he would not have done what he did in Jesus. It's, it's so much more natural, organic, and relationshipy when you see that God went first. 
And when you know God loves you, it makes it easier and natural to love him back. Have you ever heard of the reciprocity of uh, liking rule? It goes like this. I like you because you like me. It's really just that simple. That we're drawn to people we know like us. Think about it. When you walk into a room and like you see someone that you know likes you, is positive to you, you'll, you'll talk, that will talk to you and smile at you, you'll move toward them. If you walk into a room and see someone that you know doesn't like you, you'll feel the urge to turn away from them, to ignore them, to just wish they would go away. Now, if you don't believe me, see who you gravitate toward next time you come to church physically and go to the Connections Cafe. This is why to draw close to God, you have to know he loves you, period. See, otherwise you won't move toward him. When Jesus gives us these two commands, he's cutting it down from the three, 613 laws of the Old Testament. 248 were positive and 365 were negative. One negative one for every day of the year. When you make faith about rules, you won't want to get close to God. You'll want to move away from God. You'll feel shame and guilt, which make you want to hide, isolate from God, from others. This is why legalism is not loving. This is why legalistic churches are not loving churches. This is why they produce so much church hurt and people rejecting church. For they don't represent the basics of what Jesus is expressing. This is why these churches and systems turn into religions quite easily. If you put the rules first, you never get to love. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commands. Notice the love comes first. You love him because he first loved us. That's what 1 John 4, 19 says. We love because he first loved us. And when you love him, then you want to please him. The motivation is completely different. And when you get this backwards, you know, you won't want to connect with people or love them either. This part of the great commandment, uh, we'll get to later in the series, but it flows from this first part. When you know God loves you, you'll love him and love others naturally. 1 John 4.20 says, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Can, can you see how it fits together? Can you see why Jesus made love the centerpiece? Look, if you get this right, you'll get everything else naturally right. If you get this wrong, you'll get everything else wrong. Can you see how it all flows from love, specifically God's love? Sure, there, there are expect, exceptions, I should say, to the reciprocity of liking rule. Um, but for the most part, we like people that like us. One exception to the rule is, if you don't like yourself, then you're not going to like people that like you. This is why emotional health is tied to spiritual health. If you don't like yourself, you're going to have trouble connecting with a God who likes you. <laughs> We actually deal with this in our microgroups and discipleship so that we can better connect to God. Um, you'll also have trouble liking and loving others um, if you don't like yourself. You have to allow God's love to bring that inner healing to you. The main point is there's a robust general finding regarding reciprocity of liking that we tend to like those who like us. Uh, given information that another individual likes us, we tend to be attracted to that person. So if you want to love God, connect deeper to his love for you. It'll draw you like a magnet. I remind myself every morning that I'm not perfect, but I am deeply loved. I say from Jeremiah over myself, God's words, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've drawn you out with compassion. I say over myself words from 1 John, Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished on me, that I should be called a son of God. I say from the Psalms, Let me hear of your unfailing love each morning, for I am trusting you. I pray one of Paul's prayers over myself every day. God may have power together with all God's holy people to know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Um, when I know that I'm loved, I'm then ready to live and love. You know, when I leave my prayer time in the morning with a love tank full of God's love, I can love him back, I can love you back, I can love my neighbor, I can even love my enemy. I needed that filling each morning. I need it because like a cup with holes in it, I leak. If I'm not constantly refilled, I'll get dry and I'll try to love God from a place of emptiness. I'll try to love others from a place of emptiness and I will fail. So how do we get all this right? 
It's really a matter of the heart. Because remember, it's a matter of love. We need to get our heart in the right place. Now, there are several wrong places for our heart to be. Sometimes we have a hurried heart or a shallow heart or a divided heart. And, and then there's the right place for healing to happen and for us to, to love in return. And that's having a listening heart, a hurried heart. That's the heart of our culture. Richard Foster says that Satan has three tools that he successfully uses against those of us that live in the West to get our heart in the wrong place. Noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us engaged in manyness and muchness, he will be satisfied. You know, it's hard to receive God's love if we're always on the move. Um, do you know what the Swahili word for white man is? Mzungu. Literally, one who spins around. <laughs> if that's how you live your life, it's hard to receive anything. Imagine trying to throw a, a football to someone while they're spinning around. Um, it's, it's not, they're not going to be able to catch it. Look, God's trying to give his love to you, but if you're moving too fast in life, you might not be able to catch it. So how can, how, how can you stop doing one thing to make space to receive God's love for church on Sundays, for your own time with God, with a microgroup? Some of us have a shallow heart. We don't go deep into the tilling of the soul of our heart. We want the benefits without the work. We want the harvest without the planting. It's kind of like wanting to play the piano without practicing. Now, practicing is not the end game. Just like the spiritual practices we talk about are not the end game. Uh, if they are, then you end up with legalism and you'll end up with death. It's really about the relationship with God and the spiritual habits or practices enhance that relationship. The relationship is the end game. It's practicing for the performance, practicing for the athlete so they can perform in the game. Look, um, they'll do better when they practice. Well, some people look at time with God, like praying or going to church as restrictions, but they're actually habits or practices we adopt so we can live in full freedom. You know, practicing the piano releases the potential in me to make beautiful music. Practicing sports helps me have the joy of playing at my best in the game. It's not about the practice in the end, but the practice helps us reach our potential. Um, look, we have a deep heart when we've developed it by time spent with God. We've cultivated it so he can plant his good seed in it. Some of us may have a divided heart, Love has a way of centering you in. You're focused on what you love. But a divided heart is torn in too many directions, distracted. And will come out in how we love God and love others. You know, I love my grandkids. And when they call on Facebook portal, we stop whatever we're doing and answer. I mean, my heart is focused, waiting for their calls so we can share that time in relationship. When, when Cody was at boot camp, and he could only call briefly on Sundays. And if you missed that brief call, you'd have to wait a whole other seven days before you could talk. I learned to drop everything when the phone rang, and it was him. Um, you live in a non-divided heart place. Look, we have to focus our heart on God. And the more we come to know his love, the more focused we'll be on that. Other things just won't compare. You know, I love to sleep in in the morning. I really do. I am not a morning person. But I know I need to hear from God and feel his love to live the rest of the day right. I need to reflect on the things that he told me to reflect on every day. So I get up early in the morning and there's only one reason I would do it. It's out of love for God. But there's nothing like that feeling that I am deeply loved by God. It's better than sleep. It's better than riches or fame. And when you know that, it centers your heart. And you'll do whatever it takes to receive that love. You know, there's a story about a young man who proposed to a young woman. Darling, he said, I want you to know that I love you more than anything else in the world. I want, to, I want you to marry me. I'm not rich, and I don't have a yacht or a Rolls Royce like Johnny Brown, but I love you with all my heart. And the young woman replied, oh, I love you too. But tell me more about Johnny Brown. <laughs> that can be our problem too. The world and what it says is important is so alluring to us. But when you love, it focuses you. So do you have a divided heart or do you have a listening heart? And how can we um, listen to our heart? This is, remember, a heart matter after all. So where are we? Romans 12, 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, 
but to think with sober judgment. One of my favorite prayers in the Bible is Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Uh, why do we want God to show us us? So we can see him. John Calvin said, without knowledge of self, there is no knowledge of God. He goes on to say, nearly all wisdom we possess consists in two parts, knowledge of God and knowledge of self. Sadly, many today don't know either one. But the truth is these two things are intertwined. If you don't see yourself right, your lack of right vision will obscure your vision of how you need God and therefore your view of God. You know, when I get this, my heart right, I can hear God right. There's nothing clogging the line of communication between us. And I so desperately need to hear him. So how can we have a listening heart? We'll spend time in the mirror of God's word. James 1 says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, uh, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The Bible's like a mirror. And it divides our soul and spirit. It reveals and it shows us who we are and we need it. So find quiet places to reflect on God in your life. Like Psalm 4610 says, to be still and know he's God. Look, unless you make times um, to be still, you won't know. So where is your still time? You know, mine is on my deck in the morning and evening. And like the ocean tide coming in and out, I, I allow God to speak to me. Do that for yourself. Get with others also who walk with God. Like Proverbs 27 says, like iron sharpens iron. You know, we're better when we follow Jesus together. So, you know, make time for church or small group or micro groups and take risks as God calls you to, um, to join in with other people. Look, these are the times that we grow in God's knowledge and knowledge of ourselves. that the deep calls to deep. You know, James Smith and Robert Lee beautifully elaborate the meaning of that deep calling to deep line from the Bible this way. That man's deep need calls to God's deep fullness and the deep of God's fullness calls to the deep of man's need. And between our emptiness and his all-sufficiency, there's a great gulf. Deep calls to deep. The deep mercy of God meets our emptiness into which it might be poured uh, nothing can fully meet the depth of our need, but the depth of his almighty fullness. Now, we're going to explore some of the risks we can take to get to this place in the next couple weeks, especially as we get into loving our neighbor. But today, I want to challenge you to tune into God's love and get your heart focused in the right place. If you do that, everything else will fall into place. Do what God's calling you to do, what his spirit's calling you to do. Take some risks. Have you heard the story about the Native American and his friend who were walking in Times Square, New York City, when the streets were busy and noisy and filled with people? And the sounds of the city were almost deafening. And suddenly the Native American said, I hear a cricket. And his friend said, what? You must be crazy. You could possibly hear a cricket in all of this noise. No, his friend said, I'm sure of it. Um, I heard a cricket. That's just crazy, said the friend. Well, the Native American listened carefully for a moment and I walked across the street to a big, big cement planter where some shrubs were growing and he looked into the bushes beneath the branches and sure enough he located a small cricket. In utter amazement the friend said that's incredible you must have superhuman ears. No said the Native American my ears are no different than yours it just depends on what you're listening for. The friend replied <laughs> There's just no way. I could never hear a cricket in all of this noise. But the Native American simply replied, it depends on what is really important to you. Here, let me show you. So he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a few coins and he discreetly dropped them on the sidewalk. Even with all of the noise of the crowded street blaring in their ears, nearly every person within 20 feet noticed the sound of coins hitting the ground and turned to look to see if the money hit the pavement was theirs. See what I mean, say the Native American? It just all depends on what's important to you. The same question has to be asked of each of us. What's important to you? What is your heart set on? As we go through our daily walk in life, where's our focus? Is it money? 
Is it entertainment? Is it work? Is it God? Far too many people are busy being focused on the worldly aspects of life. It's no wonder that they have trouble seeing or hearing God um, in the midst of all the noise that they're listening to. They're focused on so many other things. So where is your heart? What are you focused on? The Native American was in tune with nature and noticed even the smallest detail. As Christians, we must be in tune with God and his love if we're to live a life that is worth living. And that's what Jesus is trying to focus us on in the great commandment. So where's your focus? Where does it need to be? And how can it get there? Uh, we're going to take the next few weeks to, to talk about this too. But I want to challenge you today to think about what's one step you can do in your life today to have that heart that's focused on God. To not have a divided heart, to not have a distracted heart, to not have a hurried heart, but to have a heart that's focused on Him so that you can hear how much He loves you. Because if you hear how much He loves you and you get that in here, it will change everything else about how you live your life. This is starting place number one. And it's actually a place we never move that far away from. All of us, including myself, most of all, desperately need every day to know that God loves me, that he loves you, so that I can live from that place and love him back. And as we'll talk about starting next week, love others the way we should. So what do you need in your life to get more in tune with hearing the love God has for you so that you can love him in return? I want you to think about that. And I want to challenge you to take one action this week to make room in your heart for God to pour his love into you. Hey, God bless you guys, and thanks for watching today.